Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pleasant Valley Church. It's great to see you this morning. I just want to invite you to come on in and find a seat. It is great to be together this morning, whether we are here in person, whether you're able to uh, watch online this morning on our live stream. Uh, it's just great that we can be together to worship the Lord together, to hear um, from his word this morning. My name is John Oliveras. I'm the worship director here at Pleasant Valley Church. I'd like to invite you to stand with me. And this morning, we're going to raise our voices in worship. And let us remember that we worship a God who is full of mercy and grace. I want to read from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 8. I'm going to read the first part. And then when the second part comes on the screen, we will read it together. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And let's read this next part together. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So let's give him thanks this morning for the gift of salvation that he provides uh, through grace and through faith in his son. So let's sing together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth? with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of his brilliance the king of glory the king above all this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. you've done for me. Good 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is a living God. That you would save my place. That you would bear my cross. you've done for me. Before we sing this last song, let's take a moment right where we are to come to the Lord for a time of confession. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. And God knows our hearts. He knows the sins that we need to confess before him, that we've made against him. If we need to confess any bitterness that we've been harboring or any hurtful word we have made spoken against a loved one. So take the next few moments, allow God to search your hearts, and then bring it before him in repentance. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So just right where we are, just take about 30, 40 seconds and go before the Lord. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for the drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Leave me 
behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. You may be seated. Um, is a wonderful way for children to know who Jesus is to grow in that faith, but then to go and share it with others. This is a tool that will allow children to become evangelists and to multiply followers of Christ around the world. After the children receive their shoebox gift, they are invited to participate in a 12 lesson discipleship course called The Greatest Journey. During The Greatest Journey, the children will learn Bible stories, play fun activities, and learn memory verses that help them get to know who Jesus is, and then become equipped to share that faith with others. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning. Every teacher attends a Greatest Journey training and receives a teacher guide that complements the student workbook. The training equips the teacher to disciple children and ultimately to help children get to know Jesus better and to walk with him and follow him. During the graduation, the children will receive their very own personalized certificate saying that they completed all 12 lessons of The Greatest Journey, and they will receive their very own Greatest Journey New Testament Bible. For many children, this will be the first Bible that their family has ever owned. With their Greatest Journey certificate in one hand and their Greatest Journey New Testament Bible in the other, 
children who graduate from The Greatest Journey are now equipped to go out and share the gospel with friends, family, and others in their community. Good morning, and welcome to Pleasant Valley Church. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. We're excited to see you. It's great to be in God's house today, and we are excited about what God's going to do here today, and already done through our Bible study we had this morning. If you are here for the first time, or maybe it's the first time in a while, uh, we would especially like to welcome you. We always love to see new faces. Uh, we have a gift for you outside uh, the, those doors. In the middle, there's a welcome center, and you can grab one of these tumblers, which uh, is a gift for you. Inside, there's a little information about us. We would love for you to have that information. But we would also love to know about you as well. And so at the, in the back of the pew in front of you, there's a little welcome card. Uh, we would love it if you would fill one of those out and drop it in those boxes, right, as these two uh, main aisles here. You see the boxes back there. Uh, if you would drop that in there, we'd love to contact you, let you know how much we appreciate you worshiping with us and get to know you a little bit. So thank you for being here. Now, let me give a special thank you. If you're here today and you have at some time in your life served in the military, one of the branches of the military in our country, go ahead and stand up. The Bible talks about service in the kingdom. The greatest greatness in the kingdom is defined by being a servant of all. And these men and women, that have, they have served, right? They have modeled what that looks like. They have served. And so thank you for your service. If you're here today, uh, maybe you have a, um, a loved one that's in the military, we're praying for you, right? We're praying uh, for you. Uh, we know what that's like. And so thank you for your service. All right, a few things I want to go over. The first is the shoe boxes. You just saw the video, and you see behind you lots of of full shoe boxes, and there are more still out there. So first of all, thank you for uh, participating, right, for, for bringing these boxes in. Uh, Jen Caldwell, I don't know if she's in here or she's still outside. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Jen does a great job of leading this ministry. She's kept in the front of us all year, right? All year we've been thinking about this day. Um, these boxes are going to a distribution center on Friday. So if you have a box, you didn't remember to bring it today, or you're still working on it, it needs to be here by Thursday. If it gets here by Thursday, it goes to the distribution center and eventually goes to one of their locations where they distribute these boxes. Um, and this is such a big deal, right? You saw up there that this is more than just a box with a few toys in it, right? This is the gospel being shared with kids. That greatest journey that they talked about, if you go to their website, millions of children have made professions of faith since uh, the shoe boxes, uh, Operation Christmas Child, Samaritan's Purse, since all this began. So you are participating in not just giving a gift of, of, of uh, toys and things in a box, uh, you're really participating in sharing the gospel, spreading the good news of Jesus. So thank you for that. Food distribution, coming up this Wednesday, it kind of came up quick on us, um, but we... Uh, as, as you know, once a month, third Wednesday, we uh, distribute food to those in need in our area. And November and December are always the biggest months. We're anticipating 175 families to show up for food distribution. It's more than we no normally have. We haven't had that, that many in years. So we need your help, right? We need you to be here to help us with that. If you're available on Wednesday from 3 to 6, 3 o'clock, we start getting things ready and we'll do that in the gym, it'll be warm. Uh, starting at four, we distribute the food. It'll be a little colder. Um, however, if we have a lot of people here, we can take shifts outside, right? We don't all have to be outside for two hours. So please be here. Uh, one thing about that to remember, if you come to volunteer, park uh, in the, con the concrete over by the garage because we're gonna need all that parking space uh, to kind of handle the traffic we're gonna have, so please uh, park over there on the concrete uh, next to the garage. But Wednesday, we'd love to see you. Midweek prayer time. Uh, Wednesday night, 6.30. Um, 
it's just a significant time. It is a really important time in the life of our body to come together and pray for the members of our body, for, for ministry partners, for people we know of that need salvation. I would just ask you to really consider that. If you're able to be here for one hour from 6.30 to 7.30, we would love to have you here praying with us. We'll break into groups. Um, it's a great, great time in the body of our church. Please make that a priority and be here Wednesday night. Um, decorating the, uh, the, the church. You know what it looks like at Christmas if you've been here before. It's always beautiful. There's a team that kind of does that, and they will be doing that after the service next week. So if you're available to help, um, hour, hour and a half, something like that, whatever you can give, um, hang around and help the decorating next week. That'll be next Sunday. And then church-wide fellowship, member meeting, budget vote, all that is coming up in December, December 4th. Uh, the budget is basically done, and now we're working on getting the material ready so we can get it in your hands, so you can look at it, start becoming familiar with it, and praying about it, right? Um, because this is a big deal in life for our church as we think about the ministries that we want to be involved in. So, um, and then on the 4th, We'll have a members meeting where we'll vote on that as well as some other things. We'll have a meal together. It will be a great day, um, but you need to sign up for that. We need to know how many are going to be there. So there's a sign-up sheet outside. Uh, please sign up for the members meal. <clears throat> and then one more announcement that isn't up there. Ladies Christmas craft. Um, uh, someone uh, is leading that that um, uh, influenced me to make this announcement. Um, so uh, downstairs, there's a sign-up for that. Um, it's a great outreach opportunity. Every year, there are a lot of ladies that uh, get invited to that that um, maybe don't typically come to church. They don't hear the gospel, and they will hear the gospel there, right? Uh, there's a speaker that will be sharing the good news of Jesus, uh, a lot of good fellowship. So ladies, if you're interested in that, and you make a beautiful craft. Uh, so downstairs, uh, there's a sign up for that. Uh, I think that's all of the announcements. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, we're going to pray today. We want to pray over these boxes, uh, and we want to pray for our service as well. So let's join together in prayer. Father, thank you for this day, this Lord's Day that you've given us. What a great privilege it is to be in your house, to worship you, to sing praises to your name, to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and to hear your word Proclaim, Father, we thank you for this body of believers that you have allowed us to be a part of, and we thank you for the privilege of gathering together like we are doing today. Father, we think about, think about these shoe boxes that are up here. Father, thank you for each one that has participated, and Father, we want to lift them up to you right now. We pray that uh, you would use them to bless children but Father, we, our, our, our prayer is that you would use them to speak the gospel in the lives of people, children as well as their families that maybe have never heard it before, that don't know about the good news of Jesus, our Savior, the amazing grace that we sang about earlier. Father, we pray that you would use these boxes wherever they go. We know they could go to many places in the world, but our prayer would be that you would use them to further the gospel, Father, that the gospel would be heard and that many would respond to it. So, Father, we lift them up to you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to worship, to sing praises to your name, to ascribe to you the glory and honor that is due your name. We thank you for John and the team that is leading. Father, we, we um, pray that our worship would be pleasing to you, a sweet aroma to you this morning. And Father, we pray for the word as it is proclaimed here in a few minutes. Father, that uh, your word would uh, change our lives. Father, that each one of us would come today anticipating your word to change us. Father, that we would be expecting to hear from you. And Father, that uh, uh, your spirit would be uh, on every one of us. Father, that we would uh, hear your word. And as we study in our Bible study class, not only hear it, but be doers, that our lives would be changed. So thank you, Lord, for everything. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is the reason that we are here. He is the one that we worship. 
Jesus, only Jesus. Let's stand together and sing. Who has the power to raise the dead? Who can save us from our sin? He is our hope, our righteousness. Jesus, only Jesus. Who can make the blind to see? Who holds the keys and sets free? He paid it all to bring us peace. Jesus, only Jesus. Good morning, friends. If you have your Bible, Colossians chapter 1 is where we're going to be today, Colossians chapter 1. And if you are joining us online, we are so grateful to have you with us. I also want to recognize someone else who is with us. Uh, Baby Frankie Fleshman is with us here today. Yeah, yeah, and his mom, Tori. 
their whole family back. Just a few short weeks ago, he came into the world, and we're so grateful, Fleshmans, that uh, he is here and that you are here. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, but before we look at that, I want to point your attention to a season that's coming up very shortly, and that is Advent. Advent, when we prepare ourselves for the arrival of Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you toward this devotional. Uh, Advent begins two weeks from today. We'll be putting out a Advent Bible reading guide for you to take home, along with some suggested carols for you to sing in your home, practicing family worship. But if you don't have an Advent devotional, uh, this one by Paul Tripp, Come Let Us Adore Him. Get it on Amazon, Christian Book. You've got plenty of time for it to get to you. You'll read it as a family. It'll have some activities maybe for you to do as a family. But Advent is a really intentional time for you to prepare for the first coming of Jesus Christ. We will jump out of Colossians beginning November 27th, and I will preach through an Advent series November 27th all the way through uh, to Christmas Eve. Hope you'll mark on your calendar, Christmas Eve candlelight service, 5 o'clock on December 24th, and then the following day, 10.30 with no small groups on Christmas Day. So a lot between now and then, and I want to encourage you to grab this devotional. If you don't have one, if you have one, that's great, but I really encourage you to be intentional in getting your heart ready for this Advent season. Well, let's stand together, friends, if you have your Bible there, Colossians 1, and we're going to read verses 24 to 29. Colossians 1, 24 to 29, the Holy Spirit says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, 27, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, thank you for uh, this, your word that you have so kindly and graciously given to us. Lord, we are surrounded, literally, the way this building is laid out, we are surrounded around your word. And we thank you for the privilege of opening it together, understanding the reason for which you gave us Colossians 1, 24 to 29, digging out not just understanding but as our brother Doug prayed, application. And so I pray now, as we've read this passage, we see it, Lord. But now, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would help us truly see it, that we, Lord, might be changed by it. I thank you, Lord, for your work. As Paul says here, it was your grace working in him, and so I pray, God, your grace upon me as I seek to deliver this word faithfully, that you would remove the imperfection of who I am, that people would see the perfection of who you are. And we thank you, Jesus, that you do command the highest praise. And we thank you that your grace has made that true in our lives. Lord, we also thank you for baby Frankie. We thank you for his life, and we're so grateful for new life in the life of our church, for his mom and his dad, Lord, that you would continue to give him wisdom, or them wisdom, as they care for him. And for all of our children here at Pleasant Valley Church, Lord, as, 
Uh, many of them are meeting right now, and we ask that you would open their little hearts up to understand the truth of your word. We love you, Jesus. We pray this, Father, by the power of the Spirit, and we all say, you may be seated. In these verses, Colossians 1, 24 to 29, Paul is talking about the ministry that God had given him. Now, you may hear about Paul and his ministry, and you may be thinking, well, I'm not in the ministry, this doesn't really apply to me, and I can sort of zone out for the next 30 minutes because I'm not in the ministry. Well, if you think that, if you think that as a follower of Jesus Christ that you are not in the ministry, then you are tragically mistaken because no matter your vocation, no matter your background, no matter your season of life, no matter what insufficiencies you want to talk about in your ability, you are, by virtue of your relationship with God via Jesus Christ, you are a minister. If you know Jesus in a saving way, and if, and if that's you, would you say amen? amen? Say it again. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, would you say amen? amen? So everyone who said amen is just as much a minister as I am. Let me say that again. Everyone in this room that affirm that they are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are just as much a minister of Christ as I am. Now look back at 23. Uh, in Colossians 1, because notice Paul's building on this thought he had last week that carries us into today. Notice he says, middle of 23, which has been, the gospel, has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a deacon. It's the word deacon, by the way. It's the word minister. Some of your translations say servant. So, if when you think minister, if what comes to mind is me or, depending on your background, vestments, nice collar, suit and tie, then that's not what Paul is talking about here. After all, Paul was a bivocational tent maker, bivocational tent maker, teacher, and evangelist and church planter. And when he uses the word minister here, it literally means servant. Furthermore, upon your new birth in Christ, that's how the Bible describes when you became a believer, you were born again. You were born one time as a sinner. You've been born again via the work of the gospel, by the grace of God, through the Spirit of God. Now you're relying on Jesus alone, right? That's your status before God. You are a servant of Christ. And the worst thing a minister can do is not be involved in ministry. And the good thing about you, friend, is because you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that means the Spirit of God lives in you, and that means upon the new birth, you were given gifts via the Spirit of God that 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that now you and I are to be utilizing those gifts for the overall maturity of the body. So as a minister, you are, I am, utilizing our spiritual gifts. Now, let me say this. There are some in the body of Christ who have been unusually or especially set apart for vocational ministry. You're looking at one of them. Now, when I was 19 years old, God, by His Spirit, Ephesians 4, called me into a life of vocational ministry. What that means is vocational ministry is when the ones you are serving are actually supporting you to put food on your table and all the like. And by God's grace, this is the fourth congregation I've had the pleasure and joy of serving as a vocational minister a vocational minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Me saying what I've said and what Paul is saying here does not diminish that call. It just goes to remind all of us 
that regardless of where you're at today, status, background, all that, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you were saved to be a servant of Christ. That's why He saved you, to be a servant, or as Paul says here, a minister. Now, the Apostle Paul, as you know, he writes the book of Colossians out of concern. He's concerned because the false teachers that are seeking to diminish Christ are infiltrating this very young church that has been planted by a man named Epaphras who was a disciple of the Apostle Paul. And Paul is in prison now for the gospel, and he is writing to this Colossian church to equip them to thwart out the arrows of false teaching that are being sent their way. And having established in chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, remember that Christ hymn that we looked at, how beautiful that hymn was? And, and, and Jesus was exalted as the firstborn over creation, and then the firstborn over the new creation. He's the head of the church, the body. And then last week, verses 21 to 23, we've gone as, 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 as a people from alienation from God to reconciliation with God. So we were born alienated. And, and, and by the way, let me just remind you, if you're in this room and you've never put your faith alone in Christ alone, you are alienated from God. And our hope here is that you would repent of that and turn from that hostility toward your Creator and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And when that happens, the Bible says you've now been reconciled to God. You've been brought near to God. And Paul says that once that happens, that he's a minister of the gospel. Now today, two verses, 24 and 25. Next week, Lord willing, we'll finish chapter 1, which will bring us into Advent, November 27th, and then we'll pick up Colossians chapter 2, beginning in 2000. And 23. So the big idea of chapter 1, 24 to 25, write this down. A servant of Christ, which we all are, a servant of Christ exalts Christ through embracing and enduring suffering. A servant of Christ exalts Christ by embracing and then also enduring suffering suffering. Notice verse 24. This is Paul's story. He's going to exalt Christ and show us how he embraced the suffering. Notice 24, I rejoice in my sufferings. Notice not suffering, but sufferings, plural. Now, before I zoom in here and we look at the sufferings he's talking about and we zoom in, let's first zoom out and talk about suffering in the Bible. There's two kinds of suffering that take place in the Bible. Number one is life is hard suffering. Anybody know what that's about? Life is hard suffering. This suffering is a result of a fractured creation. It is the result of living in a fallen, broken, fractured creation. One reason you suffer so much, friend, is because the environment that you live in. We live in a creation that is not as it should be. It is not as it should be. It has been fractured by sin, and this, is, this shows itself in aging. How's your aging going? Disease, broken relationships, difficult jobs, difficult employers, difficult supervisors, difficult bosses, financial struggle, mental illness, anxiety, and depression that some of you in this room wrestle with and none of us really know about it, but you know. God knows. Miscarriages, church hurt, civil unrest, political mess, Everyone in this room is carrying something right now that if I were to ask you, what is it in your life that you, it is hard and you are suffering? For many of us, not all of us, for many of us, something runs to the front really quickly. 
You know the suffering right now that you are experiencing. That's one kind of suffering, but that's a sermon for another day, because that's not the suffering that Paul is discussing here. It's a second kind of suffering that the Bible alludes to, and that is suffering for the sake of of the gospel, suffering for the sake of the gospel. It is God's will for some people to suffer for the sake of the gospel. It is God's will for some people to suffer vehemently because of the gospel. Jesus said, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for the fame and the name of Jesus, they have a special blessing resting on them. Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12, Jesus says, Blessed are you, happy are you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. And here's the reason why. On my account. Here's the response. Rejoice. Be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. In fact, write this in your margin, Philippians 129, 129. The Apostle Paul says that suffering is for the gospel is actually a gift from God. Suffering for Christ is a gift from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 as well, Paul says, God put so much on us, we wanted to kill ourselves. We wanted to die. I would say, if you want to die and you'd rather God just kill you than you live, then that is more on you than you could possibly handle. That's where the Apostle Paul and his ministry team were in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. God put so much on us, we thought we had just been given the sentence of death. But here's the reason why, he said, so that we would learn to stop trusting in ourselves and trust in God who raises the dead. Here is why suffering for Christ, here's one reason suffering for Christ is a gift from God. Because what it does is it allows you to experience nearness from God via His grace that you would not experience if things were just Krispy Kreme easy. But notice where Paul says, the reason I am suffering, who's it for? For your sake. Now, Paul never met these people. Remember that? He never met these Colossians. He's hundreds of miles away in Rome in a jail cell. He's never met these people way out in Colossae. I mean, that's like way out in the boonies, okay? Way out in Colossae. He's never met these folks, but he loves them because they're his people. They're, they're servants of Christ there in Colossae. He's a servant of Christ, a minister of Christ. They're in the jail cell. They're, they're, they're his people. He, he is their people. They are united together in Christ. And watch this now. They are beneficiaries of how to suffer well. Because given the fact that the Colossian church is going to enter into a season of suffering that you and I uh, really... Un- probably for most of us have never experienced, Paul is showing these people, this is how you suffer. You rejoice in it. You rejoice because you're getting to have a special blessing resting upon you because from the lips of our Lord, this is what he said. And so, he embraces suffering. Second of all, he endures suffering. Look at the next part of the verse. And in my flesh, I am filling up. That's that's the word enduring. I'm filling up. I'm enduring what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body, his body. That is the church. What in the world? What in the world is he saying? Is, Is Paul saying that the atonement of Christ is not sufficient? And it's lacking. I'm filling up what's lacking in Christ's affliction. What, what, what is he saying? Well, it can't be that. <laughs> it can't be that. Why? Namely, on the cross, John 19, Jesus in one word, one Greek word, tetelestai, three English words, it is what? So it is finished. So everything that needed to be done to, to accomplish salvation for sinners, Jesus said, to Telestai, it is finished. So it can't mean that. Furthermore, the word affliction here, 
This is a word, when it talks about the scourging of Jesus, you'll read particularly in John's gospel, this is never the word used for affliction. It's, it, it, this word is never used in the Greek to talk about his affliction. What it is always used for is for Christians who are being afflicted because they are connected to Christ. So it, it doesn't mean that there was insufficiency in the atonement of Jesus, but here's how it works. We are the church, amen? We are the body of Christ, and the world is out to strike a blow at the head. Who's the head? Jesus. But He's not here, right? Anybody seen Jesus? He's not here. He he is at the right hand of the Father in His present ministry as ascended King of kings and Lord of lords. So He's not here to afflict, but we are. So one way to think about this is, is the world is hostile toward the name of Jesus and the claims of Jesus, and they are out to strike a blow at him, but he's not here. So guess who is the recipient of the blow? You and I. The church, he says. The body of Christ. Now here's the really amazing news about that. When the world brings hostility to Jesus' body, you and I, spiritual union, body, Jesus feels every blow. So you don't suffer alone, you see. So when Jesus' body on earth is afflicted, Jesus the head feels it. Let me show you this, Acts chapter 9. Saul on the Damascus road as he is going to kill Christians, and we know by the time he got there, he is one. But he is going to kill Christians, and verse 4 of Acts chapter 9, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice, Saul did, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting who? me. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, technically, technically, Paul was persecuting Christians in his effort to destroy the church. But, but Jesus is saying, you don't understand what you're doing, Saul. You're actually persecuting me. What you do to my body, you're doing to me. And what Paul is saying here The suffering that he is experiencing in his jail context, in all Christians, we are simply the continuation of the world's quarrel with Jesus. You and I are the recipients of the world's... How long did Jesus live? 33 years. This is a very brief life, right? It's a very brief life. So, he did not bear the full brunt of the hatred of the world and the animosity of the world against him. So you and I are filling up that portion where he left. Not in an atoning way. Not in an atoning way. For that has been done. It is finished. So think about the suffering. is not atonement suffering. It's service suffering. Service suffering. Notice our Lord's comforting words to us in John 15. He says, remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. You know, John Wesley, the uh, revivalist Methodist preacher, he was riding a horse one day, and a thought came to him. A thought came to him, he said, you know what, I have not been persecuted in two days by anybody. Something must be wrong. In fact, he began to say, maybe I've backslidden. Maybe there's sin in my life. Lord, what have I done to not get to suffer? Is there a sin I need to confess? Now, I want to ask you, do you think about suffering that way? When you don't suffer any, are you like, Lord, where's the suffering? I thought you loved me, Lord. I thought you were for me, Lord. Where's the suffering? He thought that way. And so he jumped off his horse, he got on his knees, and he said, Lord, search my heart. Have I done something to offend you? Have I done something? Am I backslidden? And so as he's praying, somebody recognizes him, comes up, says, that's that gospel preacher. I can't stand him. They get a brick out and throw it at Wesley. It misses him, and he stands up and shouts, praise God, he's with me. He said, Lord, you do love me. Lord, you do care for me. Lord, you are near. Friends, that is a mindset, unfortunately, that you and I don't practice. But what we should view is that if, we, if it ever becomes our turn to suffer in, 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 in ways that the rest of our brothers and sisters around the world have to suffer, then you and I should be rejoicing. 
that we actually get to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Servant suffering is a God-given vocation of the church. Servant suffering is a God-given vocation of the church. Jesus' present place right now as ascended King of kings and Lord of lords, He has, watch this now, He has clothed us with power via the Holy Spirit, and we are His hands, we are His feet on earth, and our job is to point people to Jesus, enabling who He is in our life to embody a new kingdom. That's why every local church should be an outpost of the kingdom of God. So that when people come in our local churches, they should, they, should, they should get a picture of the kingdom of God. They should get a picture that, wow, these are, this is Jesus' body. Like they really emulate him there. People should come to this place and leave here saying, man, Jesus, Je- it's all about Jesus there. Yes, amen, it is. Because we're to embody this new kingdom. And Jesus is recreating the world. He's recreating the world right now. He, he's doing it spiritually on the throne right now through the hearts and lives of believers as we push darkness back and we love people in Jesus' name. One day he's going to come and he's physically going to set up his reign. And, and, but right now, uh, the world is hostile toward Jesus and you are very convenient. You are very convenient. I am very convenient. So Jesus described us as a city on a hill. We are, I say this reverently, but we are him on earth. And since it cost Jesus everything, how in the world will we ever think it won't cost us something? I mean, have you read the Gospels lately? Have you, this is why you should read the Gospels all the time. Whatever Bible reading plan you're doing, always be working through Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Don't ever disconnect yourself from the record we have of Jesus in the New Testament. His entire ministry was a ministry of suffering. He poured his life out for people. His hands were dirty. He wasn't chilling on the couch saying, leper, be cleansed. He was with the lepers. All right, he was in their midst. He smelled what they smelt like. He was with them, working from sun up to sun down. And and, and if we are called to imitate Jesus, that should be our story too. Sharing the love of Christ and embodying the love of Christ. And whatever the world has to throw at us, we will just rejoice because we get to follow in the footsteps of our Savior. Now, the early Christians, the early Christians, they were known for this. The early Christians, there were numbers of mass illness, plagues that would sweep through ancient cities, and everyone would run except the Christians. The Christians stayed with those who were sick. They, they bandaged up their wounds. Many of them caught the plague from people they were ministering to, and they died they were doing it in Jesus name and they believed that Jesus was actually doing it through them so now, so where do you think hospitals came from you ever read up on where hospitals came from they come from Christians all kinds of instances from 2000 years of church history this is why we can never disconnect from church history we must always remember we did not get here by ourselves we have a history a rich history as the church as the body of Christ and, and if you look Um, Christians were people who were engaging members in society who the other members of society wanted nothing to do with. So I want to ask you this. Who are you engaging right now as a servant of Jesus that the world wants nothing to do with? Who have you befriended? Who are you loving? Who are you intentionally going after and the world says, well, that person actually, they have no value. Look how they, look how they smell like, yada, yada, yada. Look at their mindset. Jesus came for those people, people that need him. So th- th- this is what Paul has done. Paul says, I have laid down my life for the fame and the name of Jesus. And look what it got me. It got me a jail cell. It got me put in chains. So what's the secret of Paul's joy? Well, following Jesus is about laying your life down to actually find life. Laying your life down to find life. And so Paul says, I rejoice in filling up what is lacking. And Paul says, I'm getting all the enemy's fire so you Colossians can serve God. What, 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 what a way to live. Paul's like, give it all to me so the Colossians can be over there in Colossae and they can worship. 
Now, I've got to say one thing, because there's some of you in the room, and your heart is entangled by this, because you're saying, short, all I ever do is serve. What more can I do? I, some of you are right. Some of you in this church, you are tireless servants of this body. If it weren't for your tireless service, we, we, don't, we don't want to know where God would have us. Many of you are tireless servants of this body, but you have flat tires emotionally. You serve this body tirelessly, but you have flat tires emotionally. And see, the kind of service Paul is talking about is not emotionally unhealthy service that says this, nobody else will do it, fine. I'll do it. I'll lay my life down again. Where's the sign-up sheet? It's not what he's talking about. By the way, can I tell you, I would argue that in that moment, you're not actually serving other people. I would make the argument that you're actually indebting them to you. You're actually indebting them. Because in somewhere in your mind, you're saying, I could be doing a lot of other things right now. Like, I'd love to be doing this and this and this, but I'm here to serve you. You would never say that. But be careful. Be careful. That your life is in balance, friend. That you actually know what Sabbath is. That you actually know what rest is. That actually you pray enough and trust the Spirit enough to be able to say no to some opportunities. And you can trust that if I say no, that means God's going to raise up somebody else. Don't put people in your debt by somehow serving them and then making in your mind say, well, you all owe me because I could have been at the ball game, but I'm here serving. Be careful. Be careful. Jesus is very concerned about your heart. So Paul says, my, my suffering, he, it's a joy to me. You know why? Because it's not about me. It's, not about, it's about Christ. It's about loving people. See, when you're in a good place emotionally and you're able to serve, you, you're able to say, you know, I could be at the ball game, but I don't want to be at the ball game. I want to be here. I want to serve. I feel led by Jesus to be here. I want to serve. So if nobody ever tells me, thank you, fine, Jesus sees what I'm doing, and, and that's enough for me. Now, that does mean that we need to make sure we tell people how much we value them, amen? It just means that our heart, friend, where's your heart at? Why are you doing what you're doing? Now, given our context, sometimes it's hard to imagine suffering for the gospel, especially, I mean, anybody ever had a brick thrown at them because you love Jesus? Nope. Anybody ever been in jail? Nope. Now, write this number down. This is staggering. Across 76 countries, there are 360 million Christians right now experiencing severe persecution. 76 countries, 360 million people. So what in the world are we supposed to do with that? Well, there's a, a few applications I want to I tell you about the, quote, persecuted church. Number one, we pray for them. We pray for them. I want to ask you, is the persecuted church in your prayers? Do you think often about, I have brothers and sisters all over the world that are getting chains and whipped right now, their, their children are being stolen from them, they're, they're being put up on, on, on sticks and lit on fire like Roman candles because of the name and the fame of Jesus. Oh friend, be disciplined in your prayer journal, make sure there's room in there for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering right now, seriously. How do you pray for them? Well, number one, you, you pray that they would know the presence and the power of Jesus in a special way. Number two, you pray they would love their enemies. Jesus said that, didn't he? Love your enemies. Pray for them. Third of all, you pray for their boldness to keep preaching the gospel. You've seen the book of Acts. They didn't have picket signs and all this other stuff about religious written. No, they just kept asking God for more boldness. They didn't be quiet. They just were lovingly bolder. So pray that they be, keep being bold. Fourth of all, pray. Pray their persecutors will come to know Christ. Pray for their persecutors to come to know Christ. So there, there are some prayers. And if you'd like those prayers, I can certainly get them to you because nobody can write that fast, I don't think. But you, you get the heart behind it. Pray for them. That should be your knee jerk. S second of all, um, educate familiarize yourself with the persecuted world. Here's some websites. Write them down if you would. Look, go look these up. Uh, BarnabasFun.org. Second one. OpenDoorsUSA.org. Third one. Persecution.com. Voice of the Martyrs. Fourth of all, Joshua Project. 
which is the unreached people groups and unreached, unengaged people groups. You, you do know there are about 6 million people in the world who've never heard the name of Jesus one time. Not one time. And so the Joshua Project will keep you connected to pray for country. Like in our home, every day we pray for a different country that is unreached and unengaged, that God would get people there. Because unless they hear the gospel, they cannot be saved. They cannot be saved. Don't get saved by praying to the trees, okay? They have to put their faith in Christ and Christ alone. We've got to get the gospel to them. Third of all, and finally for you and for I, rejoice in your present suffering as a servant of Christ. Friend, we have to entrust ourselves to the Holy Spirit. This is the only logical explanation that someone would rejoice when they're suffering, right? I mean, it's borderline insane to say, I rejoice in my suffering on a natural level. But with the Spirit, it's a supernatural reality. So we must ask for filling of the Spirit that we would follow His example. See, we should rejoice when people insult us or falsely say all kinds of evil against us. Perhaps you're serving on the worship team or serving on the finance team or serving on the children's team or the youth team or some other team, and you get word that somebody in this church gossips about you It talks about your motives aren't pure. It talks about how you're not doing this and you should be doing this. And and maybe you get word of it. What do you do? What do you do? Let me tell you what you don't do. You do not go tell somebody else what they said about you. That's what you don't do. Because now you've bought into the very thing they are doing to you. What you do is, as a brother and a sister, you go and graciously say, Brother, I just want to have a chat. Have I done something to hurt you, something to offend you? Let's work this out between us. See, we should be such a close church family that those conversations aren't awkward. They're just normal. They're just normal. Why? Because we are all seeking to live spirit-drenched lives. I've seen wounded Christians quit. Some have even dropped out of church or stopped following Christ altogether. I've seen pastors leave the ministry because of criticism, and I don't discount any of that. That's hard, but can I tell you, if if I quit because I was criticized or someone questioned my motives or said I was wrong, you would have never met me. I wouldn't be here because I would have quit a long time ago. But you know what? We can rejoice in our sufferings, even when our suffering comes from those who are supposed to have the same jersey on that we have, right? Right? who are supposed to be cheering us on, not finding ways to boo us. Amen? So even that we can rejoice in and we can love them in a way like Jesus loved us. This is the way of the cross. Sacrificial loving. Give up my rights loving. Do whatever I got to do to win my brother back. But you and I, we must reconcile with them, but we must rejoice that we, in some small way, in some small way, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions when he was here. Some small way I'm doing that. Now, finally, I want to ask you, any of you ever been to Yellowstone National Park? Anybody ever been there? Yeah, so there's a lot of geysers in Yellowstone Park, a lot of of geysers. And did you know the one, the geyser, that is the most famous, you know what it's called? Old Faithful, right? There's a picture of it. It's not the biggest, it's not the strongest, it's not the best, but over 4 million people see this geyser every single year. And you know why? Because it's just faithful. It's faithful. About every 63 to 70 minutes, 63 to 70 minutes, and tourists come, and you know why they wait? Because they know it's going to happen. Again, it's not the best, it's not the most pretty, it's not the most powerful, but you know what? It's the most faithful. And you know what God is calling you to do today? He's calling me today. Just be faithful. You don't have to be the coolest, the smartest, the brightest. You just have to be willing to say, I will exalt Christ through embracing and through enduring suffering. So friend, I believe this. You've got a lot to think about today. You've got a whole lot to pray about. A whole lot to pray about. But see, exalt Christ through embracing and enduring suffering. But don't forget, do it as his servant, knowing that he feels that too. Because he's the head. We are his body. Oh Lord, we thank you for saving us to serve. Lord, we know that we live in a fractured creation. And we know that, Lord, many in this room, I just lift them up to you. They're hurting. They're hurting. Lord, would you bind up their wounds? Would you remind them that the psalmist said that 
You are near to the brokenhearted. You save those who are crushed in spirit. Lord, thank you for that. Father, we pray for those in our global family that we won't meet probably on this side of glory. Millions of brothers and sisters who right now are being severely persecuted for the name and the fame of Christ. Oh, Holy Spirit, strengthen them. Give them a stubborn resolve to keep loving those who oppose them as they seek to embody you. King Jesus, we know this world is hostile toward you, and and we are the ones who feel the brunt of that, but we take great comfort in knowing because we are in union with you, you feel that too. So Lord, help us, help us realize that if it weren't for your grace, that we would be opposing you, that we would be hostile toward you. Oh God, break our hearts for people. Help us be your hands and your feet, Jesus. And until that time comes and we'll be with you, may we be faithful ministers who embrace and endure suffering because in some small way we are filling up what was lacking in the brevity of your 33 years on this earth. What a joy it is to be your representatives. What an amazing privilege it is to know that we don't suffer alone, but you are with us. Oh Lord, help us be a church that... We all have the same jersey on. Lord, help us be really careful with our words. Oh, Lord, words are so powerful. Help us be so careful. Help us build each other up, not tear each other down in any way. And we love you, Jesus. We pray this, Father, by the Spirit. Amen. Let's sing. Joy shall fill. 
been talking in small group, if you've been able to join those, about this progression of hearing God's word, studying God's word, meditating on God's word, and today doing God's word. And then, as Jordan said at the end of the sermon, we got a lot to think about, right? Embracing and enduring suffering. What a great opportunity it is for, to, to, for us to apply what we've been talking about in small group, to think about the word that we heard today that might be a little different than what we've kind of been used to, and then to apply it to become doers. Thank you for being here. Let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this day. What a great day it's been to be in your house. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to be doers of the word, to embrace uh, suffering, to endure suffering. Father, um, thank you that you love us so much that you allow us to be ministers of the gospel. Help us to uh, be faithful in that. Father, thank you for each one that's here. Uh, Father, we just pray that you'd be with us through our separate way. Help us to be uh, faithful and true ministers of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.